Uh, let me start by saying Cosmos was a huge part of my life growing up. The TV show, but also the book. Is there any chance of a big, pretty coffee table book? Maybe? I'll buy it. There's a chance. There's a chance, and uh, we'll see what happens. There is a good chance. And thank you. Thank you for those very kind words about, about Cosmos, both the book and the series. Very, so proud of Carl, and so proud of the work we did together, and the work we did with Steve Soder, who was our co-writer on the original. <laughs> it seems like the moment, you know, people are saying, how do we enthuse other people about science? Which of Carl's books would you recommend? Which of the, the books that you, you worked on with Carl would you recommend as a kind of a gift to someone, if you were to give a gift to someone who wanted to get excited and get involved? I think Cosmos is a great place to start. Uh, I also think Carl's book, The Demon Haunted World, is, is a kind of, it's a kind of error-correcting machine. Uh, it's amazing. He wrote that book when he was very ill. And, uh, you know, it just is such an inspiration because it's about, it's about science not only as a way of seeing everything, but as a baloney detection kit. <laughs> for knowing when you're being lied to, for giving you the power to evaluate the evidence. It's, uh, it really is a, a wonderful book. Carl's favorite book of any of the dozen or so books that he wrote, or the books that we wrote together, was a book we wrote together called Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. I'm really proud of that one. And, and I'm so proud that that was his favorite because uh, it was uh, the adventure of of, of, of being with Carl, of writing to, with him, of thinking with him, was certainly the signal honor of my whole life. And by the way, the subtitle of that book, you may remember, of subtitle of A Demon Haunted World was Science as a Candle in the Dark. And just the metaphor of that is powerful. And also, and you left out the word sandwich in, it's a baloney sandwich detector. A <laughs> BS detector, I just want to clarify. <laughs> officially out of, of time, but I'm going to go for another question anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you now, this better be the best question. <laughs> I hope it is. So the pressure's on. So, um, I'm Christina. I'm working on my PhD in climate science, which you guys may know is an area of science with particular delicacies that you have to navigate in terms of communicating your science to the public. And it's something that my colleagues and I discuss a lot, and I, I guess this question is for Neil. How do you navigate sort of the line between being a scientist and communicating in the scientific words and your lovely baritone voice, of course, <laughs> which not all of us yeah. have? <laughs> how, do you, how do you navigate your scientific authority versus, you know, in terms of climate science, things that we've based on the science we think we actually need to do for the planet? I, I, I'm going to answer in a way you might not have suspected. Uh, I spend, I would say, a disproportionate amount of my brain energy exploring how people think and what they think and what led them to think the way they think. So that when I communicate, when I speak, I'm actually communicating rather than lecturing. The lecturer stands in front of the room the words come out, and whether or not they match your receptors is irrelevant to the lecturer because, like, you paid for the class to just, and it's up to you to meet the lecturer at the board. But true communication is understanding how people think, what confuses them, what can untangle the knots that may exist in their head. So, especially in climate science, there are people that don't understand what they're talking about, yet think they do. You need to understand why they think they do why they don't know what they're talking about, and navigate that. And if you don't navigate it, you're just there talking, and you're this, you're this, this, this surface for them to, to, to repaint in whatever way they want, because that's your opinion, and they have their opinion. So communication, it's, it's often, most of the job is in the deliverer of the message. And you can't just sit in your office and in your lab and because we're all literate and know how to compose a sentence, believe that if your sentence doesn't work, it's the fault of the person 
who received your sentence. You should take full responsibility for how to navigate that. And that's my challenge to you as a future educator in this subject.